Hello and welcome back to my Sandbox EDB series in Kerbal Space Program 1.0.2. This time we will feature the second mission of the EDB shuttle, ETS-2, which will bring the second module of Hoffman Station to orbit. This is the in-situ resource utilization module which will help convert ore into usable fuel and also features two large solar arrays that will provide power to the station prior to the arrival of the large solar trusses. So let's begin with the launch in T-10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, engine ignition, 1, and liftoff. Liftoff. We have liftoff of ETS-2 with Valentina Kerman in command, aiming for a rendezvous with Hoffman Station. Because the first module of Hoffman Station did not have any way to recharge itself, the solar arrays on this module of the station are essential to the future functioning of the station before we launch the solar trusses. And so we are looking forward to attaching this module to the station as soon as possible. Following this launch, the next Sandbox EDB mission will be another shuttle, shuttle launch to bring up the first crew docking module, which will accommodate the GBN dockings. Once that third module is up, Jeb Kerman will bring his GBN, which is currently in orbit, to dock with Hoffman Station. But that's for a later day. Here we see roll program is in. And once the roll is aligned with the desired launch azimuth, 90 degrees, we expect that the pitch program will begin. And here we're coming up on booster separation, probably the most dangerous part of the launch. You'll note that the rapier engines which were used initially on launch have been turned off. They will be used whenever it is necessary to have them help balance the craft, but presumably Valentin doesn't feel that they're necessary now. And there we go with booster separation. It is a clean separation, which is by no means a given, but uh, with Expert piloting it is necessary, and here Valentina has let the upper two rapiers that are used for additional balance. And this is a good reminder that all shuttle launches are different. Because the payload is different, the mass of the payload is different, this module of the station is much lighter than the first module of the station, for instance. Each launch is different, and the technique to make sure that the shuttle is balanced and remains in its proper trajectory will be different each time and hence the use of the rapiers to supplement that and also the throttling of the booster engines. The shuttle continues to build velocity as its engines are heating up. We would expect the unlocking of the top fuel tank on the external fuel tank pretty soon here and uh, here we go. So it will supply the remaining fuel to get to orbital velocities or close to orbital velocities for the skipper engines. While the skipper engines are reading overheating, that is not out of the ordinary and we are still go to proceed for orbit. You can see the situation with the station there. We would expect a rendezvous with the station in two orbits and we're getting now for main engine cutout as the apoapsis is reaching that of the station. This will allow the large external fuel tank to return into the atmosphere for a fiery demise. And main engine cutout. Awaiting separation of the external fuel tank. There is a bit of inclination with respect to the station, that's unfortunate. A little bit of a problem during launch, but that will be corrected uh, by the OMS engines, the rapier engines. Okay, all of the rapier engines are active, all of the main engines are shut down, and the release of the external fuel tank so that it can re-enter the atmosphere. Okay, and the shuttle proceeds. The plot uh, does indicate that it will take two orbits to line up with the station. The uh, an attempt to make it in one orbit would leave the shuttle inside the atmosphere on its periapsis side. The fuel on the shuttle is unlocked. It was locked, of course, during launch. And again, the tail fuel tanks on the on the shuttle are not entirely full because they are only filled to the brim for a lunar transfer. Okay, so here we go for orbit. And there it is. The inclination difference uh, necessitated another burn in order to make the rendezvous and prior to that burn the cargo bay doors were opened in order to radiate heat 
and also to activate the fuel cell. You can see there the payload, the ISRU refinery and the ore tank. Unfortunately, it seems as if the shuttle depleted the fuel. The fuel on the payload was not locked. Uh, it was decided that there would be no transfer of fuel to the payload as the fuel was unnecessary for the payload and perhaps more necessary for the shuttle in this case. The payload will of course be using RCS in order to dock up with the rest of the station, the first module. And here we see the shuttle having made its rendezvous with Hoffman Station at a distance of about 2 kilometers. Uh, comes a little bit closer in order to make it easier on its payload. It parks itself at around 150 meters and then maneuvers to release its payload which is currently connected to the shuttle by struts as well as a stack separator. And then we see the payload being separated off. Not the most elegant way to deploy payload but uh, functional to be sure. In a moment we'll see the control transferred to the payload and the payload subsequently lining up with the station. The payload does feature distinctive green lights that have a range of about 400 meters and so you see here the payload's lights lighting up Hoffman Station quite easily and solar arrays are out. Of course those vital solar arrays without which the station will be depleted of power in short order. The shuttle also seemed to have the, depleted the mod propellant on board the payload, which is unfortunate, but it still had well enough mod propellant in order to make this rendezvous. The first module of the station then uh, regained control. We unlocked the electric charge that had been locked at the end of the previous uh, shuttle mission. And so the first module turned towards the incoming second module in order to make the docking more straightforward. This is of course all being controlled remotely from the shuttle. Past this point the docking was extremely straightforward and uh, really no fuss except perhaps uh, deciding how to align the solar panels with respect to the station. It was decided to align it up in line with the existing large module docking ports instead of at a diagonal to them. If there's any change in that decision further on, we will be able to undock it and redock it, of course. Uh, that will not be a major difficulty. But here we go, and docking. And so the first two modules of Hoffman Station have met, and we will now turn to back to the shuttle. The shuttle, of course, now has to make its descent with its four crew members, and we're not entirely sure what the best altitude for re-entry is at this point, because on the first uh, attempt with the shuttle on ETS-1, we saw that it way overshot and had to turn around in order to land. Uh, we would like to see the shuttle this time not have to use its rapier engines on descent, in jet mode of course, and uh, just simply glide into the KSC. In order to do that, the shuttle is placed into a 100 km by 100 km uh, test orbit, if you will, uh, so it reduced its orbit from the higher orbit of the station, and once it circularized there or close to the 100 kilometer mark, uh, it opened its cargo bay doors because the KSC at that point was on the nighttime side and it waited in orbit until the KSC was in daylight before plotting for its descent and it plotted for approximately 26 kilometers above the peninsula to the east of the home continent, as you see here. Here is the re-entry burn. A very minor burn, uh, does not take much fuel, as you can see abundant fuel resources remaining, and from there it began to descend. Because ETS-3, the next mission, will follow closely on the heels of this mission, that will feature a new crew, so this, this crew, this veteran crew of ETS-1 and ETS-2 will uh, have, a, have a bit of relaxation before their next shuttle mission. Here we see the shuttle's trajectory. Uh, it appears to be impacting on the west coast of the home continent, but Valentina brought it to a pitch of between 10 and 20 degrees, and at that pitch it gains quite a lot of lift. As you can see, it already regained about one-third of the ground that it was short, and as it crossed the, the ocean to the west of the home continent, 
it would regain most of the rest of the gap between itself and the KSC and we'll see that in the moment here and so there you go uh, about two-thirds of the gap closed and another thing you'll notice is that it actually started going up briefly at around 36 kilometers before continuing its descent so that was interesting as it gained lift but after that it uh, proceeded downward quite decisively Valentina attempting to adjust pitch to make sure that it would hit the KSC can she do it though can she land it without any engine power at all uh, well that was the question for for everybody including those at mission control here you can see the trajectory approaching the KSC but not quite there yet just as a precaution the rapiers were turned to air breathing mode and idled as is the standard procedure at this point uh, but no thrust from them just yet as Valentina seemed to have it on track for the KSC it looks very high but uh, but its ballistic trajectory was quite decisively at the KSC but it isn't a ballistic vehicle it is a a glider of substantial lift and so Valentina had to progressively pitch down further than the normal 20 degrees even and we'll see the approach here at seven kilometers here still very high and very fast pitch quite severe and around five kilometers we see the extension of the air brakes still not really slowing down enough crossing into KSC territory here still 2.3 2.2 kilometers in altitude um, air brakes still out air brakes will be out for the remainder gear down and still very high and fast over the runway uh, Valentina seems uh, quite certain of attempting to hit the runway on this run does not seem to be attempting to go around at all possibly a go around would be advisable this shuttle takes quite a lot of the runway space in order to stop itself but uh, here we go and it's already lost quite a lot of the runway length can it get down can it stop in time 30 meters and we have we have a bounce we have a bounce uh, Valentina is attempting to correct uh, the shuttle is decelerating plenty of lift available a soft landing this time at 72 meters uh, but uh, the shuttle will it will it stop in time before the end of the runway Valentina looks confident it's slowing oh dear not quite not quite no uh, it did over overrun the runway just just by a shuttle and a half I suppose but uh, at least it is safe Valentina did return the shuttle safely without lighting the engines the engines on idle for the entire time so that's quite an achievement for the EDB of course the mission was a success the second module of Hoffman station delivered and attached to the station and uh, yes of course the main thing is to make sure that the Kerbals all got back safely and they did but uh, some work on the landing could be useful here and we'll fine-tune that but surely uh, great leaps and bounds from ETS-1 alright with that I'll say thank you for watching we hope you tune in for further EDB missions in this series and of course ETS-3 which will be coming up soon and with that Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoy this presentation of Sandbox EDB. If you did enjoy it, please do press like, and we'll see you next time.